All right, and we're back. Thank you for coming back for panel number two. I hope you enjoyed that break. We have a great networking reception after this portion of the content, uh, so you'll have more time to hang out and talk to these great speakers. Uh, the second panel, we're going to talk about reinvention. The first panel, we talked about challenges. Hopefully, you have a better grasp of what we're dealing with. And these panelists are going to talk more about market-focused approaches that aim at uh, urban water renewal. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott Bryan, COO of Imagine H2O, to introduce our panelists and introduce himself. Scott. Great, thanks. Well, if we're going to be talking about market solutions, I might as well ask, does anyone here in the audience have a company or innovation that you would consider as a market-based solution to an urban water challenge? All right, one, two, we'll pick on you. Three, good. Uh, if you don't know about us, uh, Imagine H2O is a nonprofit organization. We're based uh, just over in San Francisco. And uh, we are a competition and accelerator for water startups. Uh, generally, we're working with early stage companies. Oftentimes, they're campus innovations, or they're coming to us from serial entrepreneurs who maybe have done well in another sector, and they see water as the next opportunity. So we're really at you know, conduit or first uh, point of contact for the industry uh, for some people that are, that are getting into water. So we're really excited about uh, this topic here today, uh, although we've not run a competition specific to urban water challenges, certainly we've, we've identified some great ideas and, and we'll talk about Peter's here on this panel. Before I forget, a uh, quick plug on uh, Tuesday night, next Tuesday, we're going to be announcing the winners of our, our uh, fourth annual business plan competition and it's at Autodesk Gallery in San Francisco. If you're a student and you want to come, uh, come talk to me or my colleague uh, Mark Humberstone who's in the audience here. Uh, we'll uh, give you this special secret handshake. Uh, Non-students, uh, go to our website imaginehcho.org uh, and uh, you can buy a ticket there. So with that, let's start uh, with Peter Yalis. Uh, Peter uh, is CEO of a company called WaterSmart Software, which uh, was a winner in our inaugural competition in 2009. So we've been really excited to see their progress. And uh, it's really, they've been going through the same evolution as Imagine H2O evolves as well. So it's been fun to have uh, Peter uh, in our program and to be have him uh, on the panel today. But I would say as far as, solutions to the uh, urban infrastructure, it's a capital efficient play and, I, and, and Peter can talk about that and it's, it's not all solutions are going to involve digging up <laughs> roads. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things we can do with a piece of software uh, and small uh, infrastructure and technology. So that, Peter. Thanks, Scott. It's nice to really nice nice to be here for everybody. Um, Scott, I really appreciate all the work that Imagine H2O has contributed to WaterSmart. WaterSmart actually was created at the same time that Imagine H2O was. WaterSmart was an idea on a one-page paste paper, an executive summary when Imagine H2O started, and we um, submitted that, and we were accepted, and one of the winners out of about 60 water companies, uh, and it really has launched our company. So if you do have an idea. Um, I'd suggest watching Imagine H2Os and their competitions and submitting it because they have a great process. Submitting a plan, going through the process, they have a, a world-class panel of judges to provide feedback um, and actually has provided a lot of incubation services, connections with investors, for example, uh, that have really served us well. So um, hopefully we'll see you there on Tuesday night. So what is a water smart software? Uh, we've talked a little bit about the consumer. I'm going to talk more about that here today. So water smart really is the first behavior change platform for water efficiency. What we've done is try to create a simple platform for both water consumers and for water conservation managers. And what we've done is created, um, uh, it's best to just show you what we do. You saw a picture of it um, in uh, Richard's talk, but we've created um, a home water report that looks like this. And it's uh, sent out concurrent with water bills to all the homes in a city. And it's, um, it's very visual, it's personalized, and it's targeted. So these go out uh, every billing period, usually either by email or by print, and they're completely personalized to each individual household based on their historic water consumption, based on um, 
the number of occupants, the yard size, and any other information that the resident is, uh, volunteers through a survey or through online interaction. So we can get actually very targeted um, and very high engagement rates to encourage uh, them to change behaviors and to choose water efficient appliances and fixtures in their homes. And I'll tell you more about that. So that's what we're doing here. Um, we also have it uh, online. So on my iPad here, we have real time data uh, that's actually collected by the water utilities themselves already, mostly for billing purposes that they don't do anything with. So we um, access it and then provide it back to uh, the consumers in a really easily engaged and compelling way. So what, why, were, why did we create water smart software? I think you've sort of uh, heard a lot about how conservative water utilities are. Um, and what we're trying to do is help utility managers come into the 21st century with technology. So we've learned a lot about um, how expensive water has become or is becoming. So it might be true that the absolute dollar amount that you spend on a water bill today is lower than another uh, utility, but in fact the cost of water and wastewater um, is actually rising faster than any other utility today. And there's really no end in sight. So when we talk to utilities, they're looking for ways to reduce the increase in water costs and water conservation is the least cost way to do that. So um, we've talked a lot about why are water rates rising so quickly. It's about you know, the cost of renewal, but it's also about the cost of increasingly expensive uh, water supply sources like desalination and recycling. And that's driving water managers to look for more cost-effective ways to meet the difference between supply and demand. So what is it that we do exactly? We're collecting data into a cloud-based relational database that has really never existed before together. So the utilities have a lot of data, mostly water consumption, uh, names, addresses, account numbers that kind of lives in its own database. They have a separate database for rebate programs and who's taken advantage of direct install programs, etc. That's in their separate database. Um, real estate data, utilities really don't have, so we're collecting it from county assessor's offices. Uh, and census data, we're looking at climate and weather data. And finally, we're actually getting a lot of personal information that is contributed by the residents themselves. Things like what uh, types of appliances and efficiency, uh, efficient um, fixtures do they have in their households already? And what kinds of things are they willing to do? So we're actually getting some baseline data about the things that they might be interested in doing. For example, would you like to uh, install a weather-based irrigation controller? Or would you be willing to uh, install a front-loading washing machine, that sort of thing? So with that information, we can actually target messages to specific households at specific times during the year based on promotions that the utilities are running or based on um, specific outcomes the utility might want. So, for example, we're working with the city of Newport Beach. They want to reduce the runoff from their lawns, from people over-irrigating their lawns where it runs off into Newport Bay, carrying selenium loads uh, that are being regulated by the Water Quality Board. So we can help them target messages about uh, outdoor runoff to those homes in that neighborhood, in that watershed. So very targeted. Um, so what we do with that data is produce three assets out of that. I showed you the... Uh, uh, dashboard here online, the printed uh, home water reports, and then there's a water efficiency dashboard on the lower right, which allows water managers to track the performance of the program and to interact with each of their customers and to provide reporting and analytics to their managers and their city councils. Uh, so it's really the first time that uh, a cloud-based software platform has been created solely for the water conservation manager. Usually they're really not considered in the development of software packages, especially when they're developed uh, an, an SAP, an Oracle solution. Water conservation managers are really not considered in the development. So we're, we've created something just for them uh, that is creating uh, a great way, efficient way for them to manage their water conservation programs. So uh, how do we help them achieve their, their goals? One way is to provide a lower co total cost of service. We've talked a lot about how saving water is cheaper than buying water or building new uh, water supply solutions. And here are some examples. So um, the city of San Francisco actually consumes only about a third of its water inside the city boundaries, and they sell two-thirds of its water to about 25 other cities in the, on the peninsula, uh, all the way down to Fremont. And the cost of that water to those cities is about $1,750 per acre foot today. 
uh, and it's tripled over the last five or 10 years. Um, and in Southern California, if you were a city down there like um, Pasadena, Pasadena would, would pay for about $900 per acre foot. So if we provide an equivalent amount of savings, WaterSmart can do it at between $250 and $500, delivering almost immediate operational savings to the utility. In addition, if they think they can get onto a lower projected demand curve, perhaps they can defer or delay or downsize future water supply infrastructure projects. So it's a great um, value proposition for utilities. So what kind of results have we seen from delivering uh, these home water reports? In two instances, both in Sonoma County, at the city of Katati, and with Richard Harris in East Bay Mud, where we're serving about 10,000 households, we've actually been able to reduce demand among participating households by about uh, 5% within the first six months. So that's just three home water reports. We're seeing um, period over period um, increases in efficiency gains, which is pretty remarkable. Um, Utilities also want to increase the engagement in the programs that they already run, like rebate programs or direct installs or audit programs. And we saw a tripling of engagement rates for uh, our program using these targeted personalized reports. So what does this all mean for the other big topics we've been talking about today? Um, so I'm going to share with you, um, let's see, oh, it didn't get in there. Um, but uh, uh, what does that mean really for the uh, all the other things, the integrated resource management that utilities are doing today. So I want to introduce sort of a concept of collaborative conservation. You've probably heard of collaborative consumption. Um, how many of you are members of ride sharing uh, or car sharing programs? Some of you, right? And so what we're trying to think about is what collectively can we do as an impact? How much energy can we save? How many greenhouse gases can we avoid? Can we reduce the infrastructure investment? And so um, WaterSmart is starting to look at if we can actually save 5% water demand, what does that mean for the choices that utilities and we as a society can, can start to make? Uh, so we're starting to calculate all the benefits, and they're, they're actually quite considerable, from the energy saved to the greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions avoided. Um, yeah, from an integrated approach, it's, uh, it's really quite remarkable. So that's a brief overview of uh, WaterSmart's program, and I think that uh, we're just seeing the beginnings of being able to provide a low-cost, capital-efficient solution for water utilities who really want to do more around uh, water efficiency. So thanks, Scott. Give it back to you. We'll come back to questions, but are there any burning questions that any of you have of Peter? All right, we'll move on next to Paula Kehoe. She's Director of Water Resources at SFPUC. Uh, again, I, I think when we talk about utilities, oftentimes people say, oh, they're, they're all conservative. It's, you know, when I talk to entrepreneurs, they say it's impossible to sell into utilities. They're so conservative. Uh, yes, to an extent that's, that's true, but I think it's pretty exciting here in the Bay Area that we've got SFPUC and EB Mud, both of which have been more than willing to demonstrate some new pilots so and work with entrepreneurs. So it's exciting to see that. Uh, Paula actually runs SFPUC's portfolio of water options. So she's looking at, okay, where do we get our water uh, and what's the cost of that? So uh, let's uh, hear from Paula and what she's uh, working on, but also feel free to ask questions of her work because she sees this question of urban water management through a lens that not many people do. So with that, take it away. My PowerPoint. If I can just start my PowerPoint, that'll be fine. Click down. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the things that a local utility, San Francisco Public Utility, um, what we're Public Utilities Commission, what we're doing to um, respond to our aging infrastructure, as well as our approach to water supply um, today, things we're doing today, and also things that we're looking at in the future. But I want to just provide a quick overview of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Um, we are a department within the city and county of San Francisco. We are not the state. Um, we often get confused. Um, and we have three major enterprises within the, the San Francisco PUC, a wastewater enterprise, a water enterprise, and a power enterprise. 
Within our power enterprise, we generate approximately 1.7 billion kilowatt hours of hydroelectric power, and that power is used to generate um, power at City Hall, uh, at the San Francisco Airport, Muni, and other municipal facilities. We also sell power to um, Modesto and Turlock irrigation districts located in the Central Valley. In our wastewater enterprise, we operate a combined sewer system, which means we collect and treat both wastewater and stormwater prior to discharge to the San Francisco Bay and Pacific Ocean. And within our water enterprise, which is where I work, um, we provide water to, 200, uh, to 26 um, wholesale agencies in, in San Francisco and outside of the Bay Area, over uh, 2.6 million people in total. And on average, we provide 220 million gallons a day, and 85% of that water comes from the Tuolumne River, which is stored in the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, located in the far right corner of this map. That water flows by gravity, approximately 167 miles all the way to San Francisco. Um, the remaining 15% of our water comes from local reservoirs located in the East Bay and in the peninsula. As you can see on the map, our regional water system crosses three earthquake faults. Uh, the Hayward Fault and the Calaveras Fault in the East Bay, as well as the San Andreas Fault um, in the peninsula. Most of our system also was built in the early 1900s, um, and actually portions of our system, especially in San Francisco, date back to the late 1800s. So um, in response to a system that's aging and uh, vulnerable to seismic um, situations, we are in the process of implementing a water system improvement program, which is a $4.6 billion capital improvement program. We're approximately 70% of the way through that program, and that program is designed to repair, replace um, all of our, not all of our, but most of our facilities on our regional water system. It includes um, repairing dams, pipelines, reservoirs, and pump stations. We also um, included in our water uh, system improvement program uh, a policy decision to diversify our water supplies. And when we talk about water supplies and the diversification of our portfolio, what we mean is reducing demands from our customers as well as developing new water supplies. Um, we see many benefits with the diversification of water supply portfolio, uh, our portfolio, um, including reducing drought impacts. Um, also, we, we believe that we'll, we'll become more responsive um, to the effects of climate change. We're not really sure the effects that climate change will have on our water supply today. We, we are very uncertain as in terms of what it will do to our water supply. We do believe that the, um, there will be a decrease in precipitation uh, could be potentially significant, um, and we are continuing to do ongoing investigations. But that's why we've adopted a, a no regrets adaptation approach, which means basically what we do today, we believe will help us in the future. It may not be, make us completely resilient, but it will certainly help. In terms of conservation, I think this slide really um, provides a lot of information. The blue graphs in the back represent um, the demands that would be in San Francisco alone if we didn't have conservation. Um, and what we see is approximately 23% reduction in demands. And that's between 2015 and 2035. And these, these um, projections include over 100,000 new jobs in San Francisco, as well as over um, 80,000 new housing units in San Francisco. So you can see what that conservation does have an impact. We are very, um, it's a very important part of our portfolio. And how we, we plan to achieve these savings um, is through uh, rebates for fixtures. We're, a lot of, we're, we're about fixtures, fixtures, fixtures in San Francisco. We want to get the toilets out, the high, high flow toilets out, washing machines, urinals. Um, we also provide grants. We provide a number of grants for irrigation systems, as well as grants for um, commercial and industrial applications. And we also do have ordinances. So we have incentives to encourage people, but we also have ordinances that require things. For example, in San Francisco, if you sell a home, you must, it's called retrofit on resale, you must have all low fl flow fixtures in the home prior to, to the sale of the home. As I mentioned, we are developing new water supplies in San Francisco. Um, we are looking at pumping groundwater um, from the west side of San Francisco and pumping that groundwater and blending it in with our drinking water system and serving that to approximately 50% um, of our customers within San Francisco. As Peter Glick mentioned, conjunctive use. We're also working on a conjunctive use project in the southern, um, southern portion of San Mateo, working with uh, Daly City 
uh, San Bruno and Cal Water um, on a conjunctive use project. In terms of recycled water, we are working on developing recycled water on multiple scales, centralized facilities. Um, the PUC is proposing to build recycled water treatment plants in San Francisco to produce water for irrigation on the west side of San Francisco for Golden Gate Park, Lincoln Park. Um, but we're also proposing to build recycled water treatment plants to flush toilets in all of the new developments that are proposed in San Francisco on the eastern side of the city. But we've also turned our attention to alternate water sources, and we're very excited about all the possibility for alternate water sources as a means of additional water supply in San Francisco. Um, when we talk about alternate water sources, we're talking about black water, which is water from the toilets, sinks, showers, um, cooling blowdown. Um, we're also looking at rainwater, rain water from the roof, storm water, rain that hits, actually hits the ground, um, gray water, which is water from showers, um, bathroom sinks and laundry machines, and foundation drainage. In San Francisco, there happens to be millions of gallons that are pumped um, on the eastern side of San Francisco to prevent flooding in buildings, and that foundation drainage just goes directly to the sewer system. Um, we've done a number of testing um, on the foundation drainage, and it is relatively high quality water. So we've established rainwater harvesting programs on residential scale. We provide rain barrels and cisterns. We also have kicked off a gray water um, program for residents, a laundry to landscape, where you can actually get a three-way valve for your washing machine to provide subsurface uh, irrigation to your yard on the residential scale. But what we're really focusing on is, again, the commercial and business, uh, commercial and um, mixed-use scale. We, we've done a lot of work, and we see that you could have the potential of up to 70% of potable offset in a commercial application if through the collection, treatment, and reuse of alternate water sources. Our new headquarters in San Francisco um, includes a living machine where we actually collect and treat all of the gray water and black water. That water is treated through a, a, a wetland system, as you can see in the pictures here, and we reuse all of that water for toilet flushing within the building. Um, we also have a rainwater harvesting system where we collect uh, up to 25,000 gallons. And um, overall, our water reduction is down by 60%. So last year, we, we spent a long time working with our local Department of Public Health and Department of Building Inspection, and we've created an ordinance in San Francisco. And that ordinance is designed to streamline the permitting process for any new development in San Francisco to collect, treat, and reuse alternate water sources. So there's a number of program, uh, projects being proposed <clears throat> excuse me, in San Francisco. Uh, PG&E Building is looking at taking their foundation drainage for toilet flushing. Transbay Transit Center, which is a large transit um, uh, building going in San Francisco, is looking at rainwater and gray water for flushing toilets. Moscone Center is looking at foundation drainage for uh, potentially toilet flushing and irrigation. And we have a new public safety building that's looking at gray water for irrigation. We also, just to mention, we also provide grants up to $250,000 for developers that are interested in collecting and reusing alternate water sources on site. I do want to touch on water reuse on a district scale. We're currently doing a lot of research looking at applications that are happening nationally and internationally in terms of district scale water reuse opportunities. On a building scale, um, it can be costly. Certainly on a district scale, it can become more cost effective. We have found that there really isn't any common thread, though, between all these water reuse projects on the district scale um, in terms of savings and costs. But this summer, we do plan to introduce an ordinance that, again, will allow the collection and treatment of water on a district scale. And finally, um, just to touch on additional water supplies, of course, we're always looking for additional water, and we're looking to um, increase um, or reduce our demand. So, of course, we're always continuing to look for more conservation, more recycled water opportunities. And we are looking at water transfers. Um, we have been working on a desalination um, feasibility study with East Bay Mud and other partners in the Bay Area for a number of years. And finally, we are starting to look at direct potable reuse as a potential future water supply. So that's all I have to say to keep my comments quick and short. Any questions? Yes. One 
professionals do it. Okay. Uh, so as a city resident living in St. Francis, I wasn't aware of this cistern program, so you can help to give me a little bit more information. So we have a, a rainwater harvesting collection program. So we have information where, for rain barrels and cisterns that we will provide a, a financial assistance on rain barrels again and, and cisterns, if the collection of rainwater for reuse on okay. a residential scale. Is there well a financial schools. incentive? I'm sorry. Is there a financial incentive? <laughs> Um, we do have, I don't know exactly the financial incentives for the rain barrels, but on the gray water, for example, we provide the laundry to landscape kit, which costs about $95 and the homeowner pays $5 for the subsidy. So. Thank you. You can get it from the urban farmer store, which is not in the sunset. I would also add, uh, they do a great tour of their wastewater uh, facility out at Ocean Beach. It's actually really fun. Uh, it's free for San Francisco residents, uh, but I'm sure they could figure out a way to get you in if, you, if you're a student over here. But it's, it's fascinating to see where water goes, how much of it goes out the pipe, uh, and, and the technologies that they're using out there. So with that, uh, let's shift uh, our focus now to engineering and the engineer's perspective. Um, Ralph Eberts is with Black and Veatch Americas. He's actually executive managing director of uh, Black and Veatch's water business. Uh, he's spent uh, a lot of time all over the world, actually, uh, South America included, uh, working on urban water infrastructure. So uh, again, a fascinating perspective uh, that we've got here today, and uh, feel free to push him and ask some questions. Thank you, thank you, Scott. Um, I've got to say right off, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, in my world, I, I get the opportunity to speak at conferences in a lot of different places, and if we get a slot on a Friday afternoon between four and five, you can pretty much be assured you're talking to your panelist. You know? <laughs> but you know what an engaged crowd, you know, well attended. So I, I applaud you for being here. I, I, I live in the area. Um, so I'm also thinking, well, I've heard all about Stanford bringing their classes up to 8.30 and the pushback there. So I guess maybe the worst slot would have been early in the morning. So anyway, um, <clears throat> and Scott touched on it. I, uh, I do have a little bit of a different perspective. I've really had the privilege of working in the water industry for 25 years now on the engineering and construction side, uh, really building facilities, uh, the full scale for clients like SFPUC and East Bay Mud and a bit around the world. I, I did uh, station myself in Asia Pacific for about five years, uh, came off of that a couple of years ago. Uh, they're doing fantastic things all around the world. The drivers are a little different, I'll touch on that, but uh, it's really a time to learn from each other. Um, <clears throat> one of the previous speakers uh, touched on this new age we're moving into in the water industry, and I, I really believe that, having been in for quite a while, I'm seeing a lot of new innovation, great ideas, um, creative solutions being implemented worldwide. And I thought maybe the perspective I could talk about was a little bit some specific solutions that I'm seeing and I'm seeing um, repeatedly by our, our clients. Uh, I'll start on um, maybe just the drivers that are creating this atmosphere of innovation, and it's it's around on the global scale, growing population. We of course uh, passed seven billion last year. We're uh, rapidly moving to eight, nine, ten billion, a billion probably in our lifetimes, and that puts a lot of stress on water supplies, water systems. We're not seeing as much of it here in the U.S., but the solutions are being driven. Uh, internationally for those types of issues. And then that population is really um, uh, developing differently. It's very urbanized. It's, it's concentrated in big cities, mega cities they call them. So again, that creates challenges that uh, um, to the, the water utilities primarily to put in more infrastructure in already a city that's probably very dense and the underground systems are very dense, um, yet people are moving there in droves. So a lot of challenges there. We've got, Paula touched on it, climate change. Um, that, that's a real deal in, in uh, 
the water business. I was in Australia for about three years while they were going through a horrendous drought down there. Um, Ten years, and uh, I'll tell you, if, if you don't believe in climate uh, change, go down to Australia for a while. while. They're, they're the canary in the coal mine of climate change, in my opinion. Um, they had to put in some massive systems, grid systems, desalination plants, reclamation plants in a very short order, almost on an emergency basis, to keep their industries um, with water and their population. Uh, of course, as soon as it all got done, they spent billions, tens of billions of dollars. It just started raining and floods, and you know, you've, you've seen all about that. But that's that's the world of water. It's, it's very dynamic. Um, so solutions are being driven from a lot of different ways. And, that, and then, of course, in the last five years, we've got this economic overlay that the funding's not there. We have all these needs, these challenges, but the money's not there. So, um, you know, conservation's playing a big role in that, uh, cutting back on the supplies, but there's a lot of drivers out there in the industry that's leading to innovation. So a couple of solutions I, I just got to mention, because they're local. Um, <clears throat> one is we're, on the wastewater side of the business, we're moving to resource recovery. Um, very much in the nutrients, in phosphorus, in reclaimed water, and primarily in energy. There's a tremendous amount of energy stored in the wastewater stream. Um, the organics, the, the gases, it is, is all very volatile, and you can derive energy from that. And so the more progressive utilities, in my opinion, are pushing themselves to get to energy neutral. So their wastewater plants, what that means is their wastewater plants actually pull out as much energy from the wastewater stream that they're treating as it takes power to treat that process. And that's been a slow moving process, but I'll tell you East Bay Mud um, put a stake in the ground, I don't know, Dave Williams maybe 10 years ago or something, said we're gonna make it happen. And I think he just recently declared that your main plant is now energy neutral. I mean, that, that's a fantastic story and that's a global story. I, I have a client in Australia that's flying over in June and wants to meet with East Bay Mud to learn more about that process and how they, the evolution of that. So tremendous success story there. Um, another one that's a little more indirectly related is on desalination. Um, desalination is a game changer. You know, there's only a finite amount of water in the world and the vast majority of it is seawater. So if we solve that problem, make that more of a viable energy source, then we've made some real headway. Well, it's very expensive to treat. It takes a lot of energy to treat, so there's some downsides to it. Um, <clears throat> what Singapore has been funding here as of late in the last two, three years is some very interesting research on uh, cutting the energy uses of desalination process in half. And they are making breakthroughs in that. There's a pilot plant now that they're working with a major technology provider on that has cut that energy use back to 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, for example. Right, um, units. And coincidentally, or not co so coincidentally actually, that's about what it takes to take water from Northern California to Southern California. And the reason they targeted that, because when we can do that with desalinated water, that's a big game changer. It then becomes more affordable to desal in Southern California than to move water from Northern California. Can you imagine the impacts on the Bay Delta and just, you know, it's, it's a game changer. And so they're making steady progress toward that goal. So when I'm talking about innovation and things that are happening in the water business, there's a lot going on. Those are just two really almost local examples. Better get to my slides here. <coughs> um, okay. Uh, what we're seeing um, a lot of these days on the, the practitioner side, the, the companies that are out there getting some things built, is a real focus on aging infrastructure. And that's that economic overlay. We just don't have the money to build new facilities every time we want to, to come up with engineering solutions. So utilities are doing a lot better job of drilling into what their assets are, what condition they're in, what's the risk of failure, what's the probability of failure, um, what's the consequences, what's it gonna cost to repair it, what's the range of uh, options. And they're getting into a much more systematic way of doing that. On the engineering side, for many years, we've been doing master planning. 
And that's looking at an overall facility or a distribution system and kind of seeing it all comes together. But now it's all very integrated and we have the tools available to, to us to do much better condition assessments and make much better decisions on the priorities of where to invest your, your uh, limited amount of budget. Um, I, I just got a little slide, uh, talks really about the evolution of asset management planning and on the left here is more of our traditional roles on the engineering of master planning and looking at a system and looking at its life cycle and saying, gee, it needs to be replaced. But then you bring in this financial perspective that I mentioned that you really need to make smarter decisions today about what you do replace. You know, in some cases I heard a comment about just changing operating pressures. That might be a better solution than taking out a whole line. Um, that's what these kind of asset management plans do. And then eventually, um, we're seeing utilities move to more what I call strategic perspective, that they're looking at all their assets, not just their distribution system, their treatment system here, they're integrating it all and making better decisions of, as a utility as a whole about how to spend that money. Um, it's interesting, we're actually seeing some integration now with the energy companies. Uh, we, we do a fair amount of work for P&G&E and, &E, and they've got both water and energy. And, you know, they're kind of integrating those asset management plans on the energy side and the water side. So a lot of interesting developments in that. So just a little snapshot. I'm, I'm going to move quickly because I know we want to get questions. But snapshot of one of these plans is here's, here's something in Santa Ana, so in California. You know, a GIS system of their water distribution. Um, the condition assessments kind of show what, where the, the condition of pipes are. The asset management team goes in and looks at the consequences of failure, the probability of failure. They do an analysis, they determine where the highest priorities are, and then they work through a range of solutions on that. So that, that's very much what we're moving to in the future. Um, there was a discussion Peter brought up about utilities and sensors, and I heard it in the last panel discussed a little bit. We're seeing a lot of that type of discussion, probably a little bit more in the in the academic world today, but it's starting to play out. Um, I'd say we're on the far left side of the curve now, but the evolution that we see it in my company, Black & Beach, really all we do is infrastructure, water, energy, and uh, telecommunications. So we're very interested in this area. It's probably not anything that we'll have a lot of services to provide here, but it's where we see the industry going. So um, on the, the left-hand side, you really see where we're at today is putting some devices in, collecting data, and then looking for software and, and ways to apply it. We think there's almost unlimited potential as you move up that curve, especially when you get different utilities talking to each other and sharing rate structures and best time of use of different appliances or in their systems. Uh, I, I live close by pg and &E. I'm in a pilot program. They just put a an in-house meter in that's connected to the internet, it's like an um, iPad screen. It tells me instantly, when I turn on the dishwasher, how much um, electricity I'm using, what it is against the rate. I mean, it's that real-time data. It helps me make a better decision about is that the right time to, to run that appliance. Uh, pretty soon, it's all gonna be connected together. And your house is just gonna figure it out, right? And we're gonna save a lot of water, we're gonna save a lot of energy doing that. So the potential is almost unlimited. I would be remiss when I saw Peter Glick was in the, the audience to not mention a workshop that we did um, on innovation. It's called Unlocking Innovation. This was in Singapore. It was last year. And it was part of a large conference, 10,000 people, but there was a smaller group of water industry leaders that were pulled together to discuss what's happening in innovation in areas of planning. Um, in areas of policy, in areas of project delivery. We purposely left out technology because there's an awful lot of discussion about innovation and technology. We, we, there's things happening outside of just technology that we wanted to capture. And we did that, we had nine tables. Peter chaired one of them. Um, you see him here and we basically spent an hour and a half just talking about what utilities around the world are doing in these areas that are innovative, what's best practice, and we captured it. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd just throw up some of the highlights of it. This is a very high level. There's a lot of detail. Um, what came out of those discussions were things that we challenged ourselves as an industry. We have to do the water industry. We really need to educate the general public, our politicians, on the true value of water. Um, that is not well known. There's numerous surveys out there 
uh, for customers weighing in that they really don't understand why they're paying as much as they are, what that's going to, why isn't water free, it falls from the sky. And you know, we've just got to do a better job as an industry of communicating the value of water. Uh, we, we do a very good job of um, connecting, collaborating as an industry, much more so than a lot of industries out there. The other two I mentioned that my company is involved with, those are kind of private run utilities in many cases, they compete against each other, so there's not a lot of sharing. The beauty of the water industry, most of it's public, we love to share. We love to share best practice. We love to, you know, I, I make a great living going around the world telling what SFPUC and East Bay Mud is doing uh, because everybody wants to know. And um, it, it's a great community that way. We need to integrate across sectors. We talk about the water, water energy nexus. That's real. We can talk more about that. But that's a real issue. Uh, there's a lot of synergies there, a lot of ways we can uh, um, create efficiencies there. Now there's agriculture we need to add. I, I put up economies of scope because this is something that came out of Peter's discussion, his table, about some of the things we should be looking at as an industry. And I, I apologize, I wasn't here when Peter talked, maybe he talked about it, but it's a great concept of we need to look at these industries all together and create these economies of scope and, you know, really create some efficiencies through that. And last thing I'm just going to touch on is resilient systems. Uh, that's what I'm hearing in the industry is being talked about more and more. We're pretty good at connecting water from point A to point B, but like Paul was talking about, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in that when you're crossing faults or there's other issues. You need to build resilient systems, systems that are hardened, systems that can be flexible, that can weather, you know, a reasonable size, you know, disaster, um, whether it be weather related or otherwise, you've got to build resiliency in your system. So that's probably one of the, the stronger messages coming from the industry now. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and just turn it over to for questions. Okay. All right, let's take a few questions from the audience. I know that this, uh, conference and presentation today is focused on the urban water challenge and its solutions. Um, but I'm curious about, in a place like California, where 70% of the water, give or take, is used agriculturally, how that influences how we think about urban water supply and urban water solutions. So I'm curious, um, sort of from a behavioral standpoint, Peter, are you thinking about kind of a uh, behavioral solution for ag at all in California, SF, PUC, in that water transfer play? How are you thinking about agricultural water? And I know there's agricultural water being used around the Bay Area too. Um, so interested to have all your perspectives. Thanks. So I have worked with agriculture quite a bit in efficiency and there are a couple things missing to create behavior change the kind of thing that we're doing in urban management so the first thing we, that we need is to be able to measure how much is being used and that's what allows us to create uh, social comparisons like we do here like a bar chart right so it turns out that most people are motivated uh, not by the environmental mission of saving water but by how they're doing compared to their neighbors and keeping up with the Joneses so um, uh, that's really and the engaging part of this. It's not, there actually no, there's nothing on here about dollars, really, about how much the water costs. It's really about how they're doing in terms of their water consumption. So if we were to do that in agriculture, the first thing we need to do is measure how much they use. And um, agriculture doesn't really want to do that for the most part. So um, I have looked at that, and it, it turns out that um, the, the percentage of farms that measure the application of water is less than 10% in California. Uh, most water in California is sold on a per acre basis, not volumetrically. So you might pay $30 per acre per year. They don't know how much water is actually being applied in some cases. So there is new legislation that um, is uh, incentivizing farmers to measure volumetrically in the, in the 2009 legislation. Um, but again, it's voluntary. So when that occurs, we'd love to follow in behind and help them compare their usage to create the, um, the framework. Uh, to create the motivate the social motivation to encourage them to save, but for now it's um it's going to have to be done be done on a on a different type of basis. Thank you. And then I guess in terms of transfers, um, 
the PUC has spoken to many parties, ag districts and non-ag districts, um, in terms of their interest in transferring water. Um, it's complicated, like everything else is in, in the water world. Um, one of our potential transfers did not go forward just recently um, for a number of reasons, and that was with an ag district. So um, it's very challenging. We continue the conversations. That's why I had a question mark next to transfers that um, we're pursuing them, but they are complicated and, and very difficult. So we haven't, we don't have one right now. And I just often add to that question is we waste a ton of food. I mean, the, the stats are pretty alarming. So sometimes the innovation might not be a, yeah, farmers can and need to be doing a lot more, but we also have to look at our food systems and, and that's probably a great way to save water resources. Did you have a question? I'm going to be really quick and super related, but um, I was told recently that farmers pay nothing for water. What they actually pay for is the energy to get the water to their field. So uh, I'm hopeful that by encouraging energy efficiency, we can encourage water efficiency in agriculture. But I also learned recently that a lot of farmers have multiple energy meters just on one farm. So it makes tracking all of that really difficult. But I think that there can be a lot of improvement there. So I'm piggybacking on to the topic about agriculture because I'm working with a company called Biofiltro, which is a clean tech open winner, and I'm with the Clean Tech Open organization. And they have actually a low cost wastewater treatment solution. And our key potential partners that we've discussed with have been some of these sustainable organic farms, um, wineries, dairy processing that use a lot of water. And even though from a cost perspective, it's a, it's much, much cheaper than other solutions on the market. You know, the price tag, of course, is shocking to them. So my question is, especially, I think, for Paul or your organization, whether there are grants or anything like that that can um, supplement the cost for an interested agricultural party uh, to put in one of these systems where they could really be sort of like the energy situation, zero, you know, net zero water usage, where they want to bring it right back in for irrigation after using it for wine processing, for instance. Well, for us in San Francisco, um, for us to use our ratepayer <laughs> funds, it has to be benefit the ratepayer. So San Francisco projects have to be based in San Francisco. So um, we do have a number of irrigation grants, um, large over two acres. We folks can apply for irrigation grant to, for, to, to put in a more efficient irrigation system. We also provide grants for irrigation meters that are applicable to community garden, gardens and that uh, like in San Francisco. But we really are focused in San Francisco in terms of our programming, yes. Hi, hi, this question's uh, for Paula. My name is Brian, I'm from uh, Autodesk. Um, so you have the uh, opportunity to research so many different uh, potential sources for water supply. Uh, most of what I've researched in terms of differentiating them is on energy as well as cost. In your research, have you been able to identify or uh, has anything caught your surprise in when you're comparing the different sources of water? Sustainability implications beyond the traditional cost and energy uh, implications? Well, we look a lot, we look at costs a lot. Um, in terms of our portfolio, um, conservation and groundwater is less expensive than potable supplies. When we get into uh, recycled water and potentially desal, they're more expensive than potable supplies. So for us, um, what's surprising and challenging is the cost of recycled water. Um, we are proposing to build, as I mentioned, recycled water plants in San Francisco and put in the purple pipe, trans separate transmission. It's a very expensive projects. Um, and with that um, cost, it tends to lose some of its popularity, um, but the PUC is still committed to developing and implementing these projects despite the cost. On that line, um, in terms of trying to incentivize uh, the private collection of water and reuse. Um, one of the students in my college did a study of Houston as part of their master's thesis, where they were trying to set up a water economy where the city would agree to buy water that was being um, captured on site, which then allowed people to invest in the capture system 
And then the city was then willing to um, put in the purple pipe, as you said, and actually have, they actually had a cistern that they could use that used to be a water supply place. And then the, the, the private uh, companies or homes could buy back the gray water for their system. And in the end, um, what you were doing is setting up an economy for water that would make this happen rather than just subsidizing um, you know, a specific um, type of system. Has there been any work done on that, uh, on what the sort of price points are and how you could get that to work? Um, that's a great question or, and comment. Um, we've been looking, as I mentioned, on district scale opportunities. Um, for us, we, have, we, as a utility, we have a lot of hesitancy getting involved in private property. Um, but it, we've also discussed the, the possibility of a private developer develop producing enough water um, that they could sell back to the utility. That hasn't happened, but um, it is something we've thought about. We are buying recycled water from the city of Daly City um, currently, so we are purchasing water from another utility for irrigation of Harding Park Golf Course. So um, I wouldn't say that we wouldn't get there, it's just it's not happening right now. So. Um, we are encouraging um, certainly building to building opportunities um, and that's the program that we plan to introduce in, in this summer in terms of an ordinance um, that will allow and streamline the permitting process from one for one building to share its water or sell its water to another building without the involvement of the Public Utilities Commission. So a quick question for Peter. Um, you said both of the two Examples you showed, you're achieving five or so percent reduction in demand. Do you have a sense of uh, where that's coming from? Is that behavioral change? Is it people actually replacing fixtures? Is it the utility identifying leaks in a home and going in and fixing them? What, do, you, do you have a sense of that? Yes, it's fairly early to say, but we, the indications are that most of the savings are coming from behavioral changes. And that the CPUC has done a study of this as well, showing that um, of water conservation measures, about 80% of all those conservation comes from behavior change, not from retrofits. And many of the utilities we've actually heard from today are talking about uh, the low-hanging fruit already being captured, right, especially indoors. So. Um, now, that said, we, are, we have this dashboard I talked about, so we're actually measuring where we can the observable actions that people take at their homes. And we categorize them, and we actually have analytics behind it that will be able to tell us when we get more data. Um, right now, it's not statistically significant in terms of the, the numbers of observations, but we are getting there, we have, we're tracking it. So I imagine we'll be able to tell it to say with more specificity down the road. Um, that's true, like the initial sort of bump you might see in the graph that I showed is probably almost all behavioral because it takes some time, right, to apply for the rebate and get it installed and so on. So that initial, that first six months may be most, you know, almost entirely behavioral. So people, you know, I think I learned from you and we've worked together in the past that people do change, they do learn, and it's possible to change people's attitudes and behaviors um, and using tools like information like many of these utilities are doing as possible and we're showing that it's, it's feasible and cost effective and that behavior change should be just another water conservation tool in the toolkit just like rebates and direct installs and audits. Um, they're not currently, uh, behavior change isn't currently thought of that way but I think it should be and, and I think the PUC for example is looking at it that way. Uh, Ralph, I had a question for you about uh, cities, especially maybe cities over overseas. Yes, you've got big centralized projects like desal or big wastewater treatment centers, but what are you seeing as the role of decentralized or smaller scale projects within the urban environment where, you know, a shopping mall all of a sudden becomes the, or is converted into a wastewater treatment center, and that we're not thinking big, but like we're seeing in energy, the power of decentralized solutions? <coughs> Yeah, good, good question. Um, I'd, I'd say, if anything, the trend's almost moving away from big decentralized or big centralized facilities to a more decentralized system. Um, 
especially as you bring in things like reclaimed water, mm -hmm. you know, to bring wastewater all the way down to the lowest point, which obviously is where it's, it's easiest to collect it, and then have to pump it back up in the system doesn't make a lot of sense. So solutions, you just mentioned party park, and, and um, you know, when they looked at Golden Gate, those are a lot more, you know, local to that, where they'll do scalping of the sewer lines, things like that. So we, we see that actually getting pushed back up into the system, creating efficiencies that way. Any other questions? Okay, right. hey, Richard. A last quick question. It's all you, Richard. Okay. It's, it's a comment and a question real quick here, but it, it follows on uh, Peter's uh, Glick's question. And uh, in East Bay Mud, working with Water Smart, and it's been a great research project. And one of the things we find, and I, this question could be for Peter or Paula, uh, when we survey customers going back over a decade, and even in the surveys that Water Smart has had in their application, repeatedly customers underreport their knowledge of their household use. So when we ask customers, they underreport many fold and we'll say how much do you think your home a family of four uses and they'll say 50 gallons a day and we'll say did you know it's about 90 to 100 per person and i know in the in our own pilot with the water smart software uh those that thought they used less than 100 gallons per day for that household was uh greater than 60 percent said that's what they use in reality greater than 85 percent were above 150. so that's where the behavior comes in but also what we find is when we ask customers do you think you can serve they say yes and we ask them, what was the last thing you did to conserve? And they pause, and they can't repeat what they did. So I think the, the social challenge and the benchmarking, which really been successful, is just that awareness, and then seeing the comparison, and then that word of mouth, and talking it through. And Peter or Paula, I'm curious, you have a number of other pilots going on, Peter, and are you seeing the same differential between how customers report what they think they use before they get the aha and go, wow, now I can actually do something? Yeah. Yes, it's very fairly common that people overreport. So when we start a project, we usually send out a paper or electronic survey to all the homes in the in the project, and they continually report two to four times more, or sorry, less than they actually use. And when utilities get phone calls from their customers, most com most common calls because they just cannot believe they're shocked at how much they're using. It, it has to be wrong because they cannot process that they actually used 30,000 gallons in the last billing period. You know, and how many of us know how many gallons we used in our home for the last year? I, I do, I track it, you know, it's about 120,000 gallons for the year. But most people really have no conception. So this, is, this report and the feedback we're providing is the first time they're really seeing their use in any graphical or way that they can conceptualize. It's, it's, not, it's in gallons instead of 100 cubic feet or cubic meters or whatever the unit is that the utility builds on. So, there is an aha moment there, and that sort of hooks them into wanting to find out more how they compare and what are the things they can do to save money, energy, and water. So, well, um, we haven't done a survey, but I think we will find out soon because uh, currently we are installing automated meters. So um, those meters will have the ability to do readings four times a day. Um, unlike the meters that we had before, you would get your bill every two months. So there's certainly going to be a big difference between getting um, daily reads four times versus getting a bill once every two months. So we haven't gotten there, but I'm sure we will have some interesting response when we do get there. Great. This has been great. Please join me in thanking this panel.